What's up, guys? We are back with Week 7 Thursday Night Football action. We are going to do a deep dive on this match between the Denver Broncos and the New Orleans Saints and see what kind of value you can find on the side and on the total, and we're going to take a good, hard look at the player props as well. Also, I'm going to break down both MLB games, Game 3 between the Yankees and Guardians, and Game 4 between the Dodgers and the New York Mets. On top of all that, we're also going to look at the two college football games for Week 8 on Thursday night. Wednesday didn't exactly go according to plan, guys. A bit of a rough night out there. We were right on a couple of player props, but across the board, not exactly the day we were aiming for. So we're going to try and bounce back out there. Really nice to have some real sports here to look at with Thursday night football. If you want to win all of your Thursday bets, hit that like button. It's good luck and show support for the channel and all the hard work we're putting in every single day. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on our daily content. You can now also sign up for a channel membership by clicking the little join button right below the video. Members get exclusive early access to all NFL and college football videos and get their names up on screen just like right now. I really appreciate the support from all of you. Seeing that little badge next to your comments absolutely warms my heart. Our videos are sponsored by StompTheSpread.com. We have a team of experienced cappers over there for every major sport, currently covering NFL, NCAA football, UFC, NHL, and MLB. And guys, we have NBA season right around the corner. I absolutely cannot wait. This is one of the best times of the year to be in the mix with so many sports going on. Click the link in the description if you're interested in signing up and also to join our free email list to get the occasional free or premium pick straight to your inbox. Comment below with any bets you're looking at today and we will give you our best advice on all of them. We are committed to responding to every single comment every day. So let us know anything you want to say about my picks, these videos, or anything you see here. As always, our favorite picks will be in the pinned comment down below. Now let's get into the Denver Broncos going on the road to take on the New Orleans Saints in a Thursday night showdown. The Broncos come into this game fresh off a tough loss there. Their loss against the Chargers last week snapped a three-game winning streak, losing 23-16 to against the Chargers. Probably not the best look as, you know, LA hasn't been having an amazing season, but at 3-3 three and three on the year, honestly, starting a rookie quarterback and all that kind of stuff, Denver probably doesn't feel too bad about where they're at. In that loss to the Chargers, guys, Bo Nix actually played relatively well out there. Not a lot to complain about. I mean, he passed the ball pretty well. He was good there in the running game definitely did some positive stuff so what can we expect to see from this week it'll be interesting I mean 19 of 33 for 216 two touchdowns one interception he was sacked twice uh, also ran for 61 yards on six carries not a bad performance there from the rookie whatsoever I think Denver has to be very very happy with the progression they've seen from him so far this season if they wanted to be their quarterback in the future this is not looking like a terrible first season at least not at the moment the running game didn't look amazing there last week I, uh, outside of Bo Nix really we need to see Javante Williams step up a bit in this one although he was very active in the passing game got a lot of targets but didn't really pile up too many yards only 10 receiving yards there for him in the game so yeah, a little bit problematic there. Not exactly what you want to see from your, uh, you know, top running back. The defense, guys, Denver's been a great defensive team this season. They gave up only one passing touchdown to Herbert, allowed him to complete 21 of 34 passes, not terrible, and they sacked him three times. The problem there for Denver, they didn't generate a single turnover, come up with one turnover in this game, and the outcome could have looked completely different. They didn't do an amazing job against the run. That's a bit of a concern. They let J.K. Dobbins pile up 96 yards and a touchdown on 25 carries. So you're not a complete disaster game necessarily, but not what we're really used to seeing from this Denver Broncos defense that has been very good this season. Generally speaking, I would say that's been the primary strength of this team. They're only allowing 16 points per game. That's fourth in the NFL. So like what we're seeing here from Denver defensively, they haven't played maybe not the toughest schedule this season. I wouldn't say it's even close to the toughest, but they've managed to do some pretty good things. And it seems like they're getting better here as the season progresses. Looking at the injury report here for Denver, the whole Broncos offense is healthy coming into this game with the only exception being their right tackle who's technically listed as questionable there is for sure a legitimate chance we see him play in this game though he was already practicing in a limited fashion back on monday so that is a great great indication that we are going to see him out there for this game here on thursday night on defense, the good news continues for Denver here on the injury report. They're almost fully healthy on that side of the ball. Only Pat Sertain, the second, is questionable. Coming off that concussion, I think there's a significant chance we see him miss this game. But with concussions, guys, that can always be pretty up in the air. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But regardless, guys, we see the Denver Broncos in terms of injury and stuff like that. They are in very good shape here despite playing on the short week. Their opponent in this game, the Saints, they come into this one fresh off of another loss. They've now dropped four in a row after winning their first two games. 
They got absolutely destroyed by Tampa Bay, 51 to 27. Very, very rough stuff there. Obviously, not having Derek Carr, a huge deal. He's officially doubtful for this game. We'll get more into that in the injury report, but I do not think we're going to see him playing. Spencer Rattler did not look great. Uh, 22 of 40, 243, uh, one touchdown, two interceptions and he was sacked five times. Definitely something else that we're going to be looking at a little bit there in the injury report. The Saints offensive line, not in the best spot. Kamara didn't have a great time running the ball. 13 carries, 40 yards, one touchdown. Wasn't super useful there in the passing game either. He was targeted eight times, caught five balls, but only for 24 yards. So Rattler not looking great out there running the offense. The offensive in general is not healthy, and the offensive weapons that are out there not having the best time. So really things looking pretty rough out there for the Saints, guys. Not 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 what things were looking like there in the first couple weeks. It was all sunshine and roses, and things have kind of fell, fallen off of a little bit of a cliff here. So we'll see what they can do to bounce back on offense. On defense, giving up 51 points to the Buccaneers. Not a great look. They did have three interceptions there against Baker Mayfield. That was that was good. Well played there. They had that you know punt return. That was cool. But yeah, not, uh, not a lot of positives, guys. They could not stop the run. They really could not stop the pass in the second half there, giving up 27 points. Not a great look. They struggled mightily against Chris Godwin like this is not a team that really uh, has been impressing me on defense at least not lately and a lot of that can be laid at the foot of just overall health it's been really really rough out there guys looking at the Saints injury report this is a long long report so buckle up guys first off we have Derek Carr technically doubtful for this game I think it would be an actual miracle for him to end up playing here on Thursday Kamara he's listed as questionable he's been practicing in a limited capacity with his hand issue I think it's very likely he ends up playing here even even though it's a short week, I think we probably see him out there. If it was a lower body injury, I'd be a bit more worried, but I think just with a hand issue and the fact that he's already practicing, we're very likely to see him out there for this game. In terms of Chris Olave, though, the wide receiver group, not in good shape for the Saints. Olave did not practice on Tuesday in the concussion protocol, and while there's a chance he plays, I would say I'd be at least a little bit surprised, and I'd also be surprised to see him be very productive there. Rattler doesn't really seem like a guy that's going to do a great job, at least not yet, of getting the ball out there to those receivers. And on the same side of that, guys, we've got Rashid Sunid. He is dealing with an ankle injury and didn't practice on Tuesday. I think it's pretty unlikely we'll see him play in this game. And if we do see him play, dealing with an ankle injury as a wide receiver can be a very, very tough look. So overall, not looking too hot there for the Saints right now. And the bad news continues, guys, on the offensive line. We see Ruiz and Patrick both listed as questionable for this one. It's a big concern if the middle of the offensive line is not going to be fully healthy for this game. That was a big, big problem. Rattler was running for his life and not very good at it, getting sacked five times last week. So got to do a better job of protecting him to even give him the slimmest of slim chances chances out there so worried about that also worried about this uh defense guys the saints are banged up on each level nathan shepherd questionable in the defensive line pete werner questionable at linebacker and alante is banged up in the secondary but since he was practicing in a limited fashion on monday i think there's a good chance his shoulder injury doesn't keep him out for this game Regardless, guys, not loving what we're seeing from the Saints defense. They're not going to be fully healthy for this game. I see very little chance of that. So right now, things absolutely not pointed in the direction the Saints or their fans would have wanted, especially after that fast start to the season. So guys, this would normally be the part where we would look at the weather. This game's in a dome, so no major weather considerations whatsoever, obviously, here. Quickly looking at some trends here. We've got Denver. They are 4-2 two, and two against the spread. They are 3-3 three and three to the over-under this season. The Saints, 3-3 three and three against the spread and 4-2. and two to the over this year. Looking at the numbers for this game, guys, the Saints are getting two and a half points here playing at home. We got an over under of only 37 in this game. Initially looking at this game, guys, I was leaning slightly towards New Orleans playing at home, but we didn't have very much clarity on that injury report. Bo Nix as a road favorite seems a little bit crazy, but with all the injuries that the Saints have, it's starting to look like this is definitely a Denver Broncos play. Historically, the favorites do well in these Thursday night games. The Saints are completely decimated with injuries right now. Bo Nix stayed locked in all the way last week despite not having the best time. I'm expecting Denver to take advantage of this banged up Saints team and get a convincing win in this one. They've only got a win by a field goal. Go ahead and give me Denver minus two and a half here playing on the road. In terms of the over-under, under looks like a very reasonable play in this one, guys. Neither team is going to be killing on offense, I don't think. And while neither defense, well, the Saints defense doesn't impress me too much. I don't think they're terrible. I don't think they're going to get completely destroyed here by uh, somebody like Bo Nix. The under guys is six and one in the last seven games where Denver was a road favorite coming off of a home loss. 
and the under is 8-2 and two in the Saints' last 10 games against AFC opponents. Also, like we discussed, the entire offense is injured for the Saints. They are not going to be scoring a ton of points here. So, yeah, I think the under is good value in this game. I also definitely am leaning towards Denver there, minus 2.5. Now, guys, let's hop over and take a look here at some game and player props. First up, I don't think we're going to see a ton of points in this game, generally speaking. So looking at some first drive punt options could be a reasonable idea. Denver to punt on their first drive is minus 145. The Saints to punt on their first drive is minus 165. Obviously not the greatest price tags there, but I don't think we're going to see a ton of offense here, guys. I like these punt plays a decent amount. Like I said, these offenses not impressing me too much on some regular player props here. First up, I think Rattler over 174 and a half passing yards at minus 140 is a very good spot. I think he's going to have to be throwing the ball. I think they're going to be losing in this game. I think they're going to struggle a bit to run the ball. So yeah, him having to throw the ball, getting over 174 passing yards doesn't seem that crazy. He passed for 243 yards last week, despite getting picked off twice and sacked five times. I don't think they're going to completely alter the you know whole face of this offense and just start handing it to Kamara every down. That is not not going to be the way this goes. So Rattler to get over 174 and a half passing yards seems very, very good to me. I also want to take a look at Bo Nix here. I'm looking at his running prop here. Bo Nix, 25 plus rushing yards is minus 115. I think that's very reasonable. Last week, he rushed the ball six times for 61 yards. So very, very reasonable stuff there. He hasn't been taken off too much, but I think this is a good chance, especially after seeing the success he had last week to tuck and run. And he doesn't take too many rushes. I would say if he runs the ball four times, he could likely get over that 25 yards. And with the Saints having a linebacker and a defensive lineman banged up for this game, I think he's going to be able to get some yardage on those runs that he does make in terms of an actual running back prop here guys I think Kamara under 69 and a half rushing yards at minus 115 makes a ton of sense it's one of my favorite props out there for this game keep in mind I'm not a huge prop guy but still I think this one's definitely worth a look he was well under that number in the last two weeks this banged up offensive line definitely having an impact on him also you can't really like th this team is you can't trust the quarterback to be throwing the ball so Kamara getting it is going to make a ton of sense there are going to be a lot of eyes on him so under uh, 69 and a half rushing yards for him seems very, very good to me. Javante Williams, 20 plus receiving yards is at even odds. He went over that number three out of five weeks this season. He had six targets last week, and while he didn't make a ton out of them, if we see him get six or so targets in this one, obviously we are going to be looking at Bo Nix, very willing to check stuff down once again. So I think it'd be crazy to see him, you know, not get some receiving yards. And going up against a banged up Saints defense, I think we could see him be very productive there out in the flat or just in general catching some passes. I also like Devonta Vile. 30 plus receiving yards at plus 105. He had 78 yards last week on six targets. This rookie absolutely cooking out there when he's on the field. They've tried to keep him off the field, but that is not going to be the case anymore, guys. This kid is killing it. I'm expecting very, very good stuff from him. 30 plus receiving yards, plus 105. Give me that all day long. I like this spot an awful, awful lot. I'm not going to say he's clearly Bonex's favorite target, but man, it looks like they have great chemistry here right out of the gate. So I'm expecting a big night from him. This play, very very likely to go in the pinned comment. Last but not least, guys, we have a kicker prop. I like Will Lutz over one and a half field goals made at minus 125. This Denver offense isn't amazing, but I think they're going to move the ball well enough against the Saints to get into field goal range pretty often. Do I trust them to get into the end zone every single time? I do not. So a couple of field goals made out there, especially kicking in a dome environment, seems extremely, extremely reasonable to me. Go ahead and give me Lutz here over one and a half field goals made. That's all we've got for Monday Night Football, guys. Now let's go ahead and jump over to this exciting two game slate of major league baseball action. Hey guys, jumping in here with a quick ad break. First of all, this is a great time to sign up at stumpthespread.com. Signing up for a premium membership gets you access to our entire team of cappers covering MLB, NCAA football, UFC, and the NFL. If you just want to test out the service, a great way to do that is by joining our free email list, which will get the occasional free or premium pick straight to your inbox. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you're new and become a channel member for early access to all of our NCAA football and NFL videos. Now guys, back to the games. 
first game up, guys. It's kind of a late afternoon game. We've got the New York Yankees going on the road to take on the Cleveland Guardians. The Yankees obviously come into this game probably, uh, I would say, feeling pretty solid about how this series has started, guys. Winning the first two games pretty comfortably. A 5-2 win in Game 1. A 6-3 win there in Game 2. The Yankees cannot feel bad about how things look. We saw Judge hit his first home run of the postseason, so that has to feel great to get their best hitter on track. Uh, very good stuff there from Torres at the top of the order. We also saw a great start. Maybe great is a little bit strong, but a solid start there from Garrett Cole and very, very elite stuff there down the stretch from that Yankees bullpen. Excellent stuff there. They have to be thrilled with what they saw in Game 2. Coming into Game 3 here, they're going to be hitting the ball to Clark Schmidt. He's 5-5 five and five on the season with a 2.85 ERA. His last start was against the Royals. If he didn't stay out there too long, four and two-thirds innings, he's not really a guy you can trust to go deep into games, but he gave up two earned runs over those innings, had four strikeouts. He's done some positive things. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit worried about him out there, but with that Yankees bullpen to back him up, maybe it's not the end of the world. We'll see what he looks like here against Cleveland, a team that he faced back in April and had an okay time against, but that's such ancient history, guys. Not a whole lot to be gleaned from that. So we'll see what he can do out there in this one. He's looked good, I would say. Maybe not dominant over his last five starts, but playable here. And obviously the Yankees will have a pretty short leash with him. Not going to leave him out there to get in a ton of trouble. Even though they're up two games to nothing, I think this is definitely a team that has their eye on the long-term prize. So no reason to uh, you know mess around too much. They are going to yank him if things get bad. And then we will see that vaunted Yankees bullpen that looked so good. They will continue to look good. I'd be very surprised if they don't. Out. This is a bullpen that's been very, very solid over the course of the season. They weren't as good as Cleveland was in the regular season. Maybe at the beginning of the year they were right there, but down the stretch, not nearly as good. So we'll see what the bullpen can do here for the Yankees, but I'm overall expecting very, very good things from their bullpen. And in terms of their offense, like I was saying, guys, a great game for them there in game two. 11 hits, six runs scored. Obviously, Torres great at the top of the lineup. Soto got a hit. Judge got that home run. That had to feel good. Stanton continues to struggle a little bit. That's probably a bit of a concern but we also saw the bottom of the order look good. Rizzo swinging the bat well, Chilsom Jr., Volpe, like this is a team that can hit up and down the lineup. So if we have a game where they all kind of figure things out at the same time, they could put up some big, crazy postseason number, even going up against elite pitching. So obviously, guys, all the reason in the world to be high here on this Yankees offense. We'll see what Cleveland can do to slow them down, guys. Uh, the Guardians have to be in desperation mode here, down 0-2. They uh, yeah, just couldn't get it done there in either of the first two games. We saw Bybee get shelled right out of the gate there in game two. The bullpen came in and did some good, some bad. But yeah, when you're asking a bullpen to effectively pitch the entire game when that's not what they were initially set up to do, Things can get a little bit rough out there, especially in the postseason, especially going up against a team like the Yankees. So Guardians, like I said, in desperation mode here, guys, they're going to be handing the ball to Matthew Boyd, who's 2-2 two two on the season, a 2.72 ERA. His last start, he only went two innings against Detroit, but it was two innings, one hit, five strikeouts, one walk. Very good stuff there. Start before that was also against Detroit. Four and two thirds innings, four hits, five strikeouts in that one as well. Very, very good stuff from him. Definitely capable of getting this team off to a good start and then handing it off to that elite bullpen. Although, is the bullpen going to be a little bit tired? I don't know. We'll have to see, guys. It's the postseason. It's kind of time to... Uh, put up or shut up. The last time we saw Matthew Boyd against the Yankees, though, back on 820, gives us a little bit of room for concern. He went five and a third innings. It was a nine to five win there for Cleveland, but that happened in a 12 inning extra inning game. Yeah, he gave up four walks, two strikeouts, two home runs in that game. Like, not elite history here for Matthew Boyd going up against the Yankees. That was only his second start after coming off of, you know, like to just to start his season off. Like that was his second start of the year. So obviously he probably wasn't 100% comfortable out there, but we'll see what he can do in this one. I definitely have my questions about him. Very few questions about that Cleveland bullpen, though. They are a very solid bullpen. If handed a lead, I think they are very, very likely to be able to protect that lead. So we'll see what happens there in the pitching situation for Cleveland in terms of their offense. Putting up three runs there in game two. I mean, not the worst performance, but not the best. Uh, we saw Ramirez hit a home run. Good to see him get back on track. We saw Naylor hit the cover off the ball. That was great. The top four, maybe five guys in the lineup did all the work, and the bottom of the lineup kind of didn't look amazing. So definitely some concern there. Going to need uh, you know just to bunch those hits up a little bit more. They could have definitely had more than the three runs they had in that game. Yeah, just, I mean, Ramirez hitting that home run there in the top of the ninth inning, just kind of a feel-good story. They need more production from him earlier in the game. So we'll see what they can do on offense. Obviously, this wasn't one of the most elite offensive teams in the majors over the course of the season, so plenty of room there for question marks about that. 
looking at the numbers for this game, guys. The Yankees are minus 110. The Guardians are plus 100. We've got an over-under of seven out there. The Yankees are 50 and 31 on the road. That is an MLB best road record this season. So that's pretty impressive. They're also an over team on the road, 42, 36, and three to the over when playing away from home. Cleveland, they were a dominant home team, 51 and 30 at home. They were 39, 37, and five to the over at home. So a slight over team at home, nothing too crazy there, guys. In terms of the side in this game, it seems a bit rough. I'm not super high on either starter in this spot, to be honest. I side slightly towards Cleveland here in desperation mode. I think they will uh, manage to get a win here at home. You know, this is a big, big deal. I think we see them get on the board here with an over under of seven out there. I do tend to lean a little bit towards the over given the trends of these two teams and the starting pitching that we have out there. It seems like both offenses are heating up a little bit. We obviously saw nine runs scored there in game two. I don't know if we'll quite get to nine runs here, but I think we get to eight pretty comfortably. And yeah, with it just being seven, not seven and a half, I think that is a pretty reasonable spot as well. In terms of some player props for this game, guys, first up, I do think yes, run first inning at even odds is pretty reasonable. I don't, I'm not in love with it. Obviously, I'm never in love with any no run first inning or yes, run first inning spot. But I do think if you're committed to that bet, I think you would want to probably go with yes, run first inning in this game. Also, guys, jumping into some actual player props here. I think Clark Schmidt over four and a half strikeouts at minus 110, relatively reasonable here. I think we'll see decent stuff from him, at least in terms of strikeout numbers. I mean, he's a guy that puts up some strikeouts, no doubt about that. I mean, over his last few outings, four, five, seven, seven, and five strikeouts. So to get to five strikeouts for him, does not seem like too much of a stretch. Is this one of my favorite props? Probably not. One that I definitely think is reasonable, though, I like Matthew Boyd over three and a half strikeouts. That's at plus 120. There are plenty of these Yankee sluggers that aren't too embarrassed to strike out every once in a while. And by every once in a while, I mean pretty often. To get to four strikeouts for Matthew Boyd is not a big deal at all. He, against the Yankees, the first time he faced them, guys, he had two strikeouts. But over his last three starts, his last four starts, he's had at least five strikeouts in all of them. So obviously those weren't against... Yankee caliber uh, offenses, no doubt about that. But I think to get to four strikeouts in at plus 120 is extremely reasonable odds. We're not really going to be looking at any home run props for this game, guys. Neither one of the starters really give up the long ball too much, but there are a bunch of hit props that I like a good amount. I like Quan to get a hit in this game. He keeps hitting there at the top of the lineup for Cleveland. The dude has been looking awesome out there. So kind of expect that to continue. I also think Josh Naylor to get a hit in this game at minus 180. He killed it out there in game two. I don't think we're going to just see that completely dry up for him. So Naylor to get a hit makes a ton of sense. I also like Thomas here to get a hit at minus 160. That's a great price. He's swinging the bat well right now. Slightly lower in the lineup. I guess that's the reason for that price, but I'm expecting good stuff from him out there in this game. On the Yankee side, Torres to get a hit seems extremely reasonable. You could talk me into pretty much any uh, hitting prop for him in this game that's pointed in a positive direction. Uh, yeah, three hits there in game two. He's swinging a very hot bat out there, keeping things rolling there for the Yankees at the top of the lineup. I also like Rizzo to get a hit. He had two hits in game two. It's at minus 160 for him to get a hit in this game. That seems like a great price to me. So go ahead and give me Rizzo here. I think he gets on the board with another hit here. I also like Aaron Judge over one and a half total bases at plus 110. He had a two-run home run in the seventh inning. Seems like he's back on track here. Obviously, he could hit a home run. So if you wanted to do a home run prop desperately, I could see Judge being a decent spot here. But I think he could hit a double, a couple. You know, I think he could get to over one and a half total bases pretty comfortably. And at plus 110, that is a very reasonable price. Next up, guys, we've got the LA Dodgers going on the road to take on the New York Mets. The Dodgers come into this game fresh off of a solid eight to nothing game two win there, game three win there over the Mets. Yeah, very, very good stuff. We saw Bueller have the game of his life there for the Dodgers. Has to feel amazing about that. Really kept his team, you know, in a perfect position. Otani hitting a home run is a great look. Uh, yeah, just shocking to see Bueller out there giving up three hits and striking out six, giving up no runs there. It took him 90 pitches to get through those four innings, but excellent, excellent stuff from him. And the bullpen followed him up and looked great out there. Elite, elite stuff from the Dodgers. So they'll be hoping to follow that up here, handing the ball to Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who was 7-2 on the season, a 3.00 ERA. His last start, guys, was probably the best, most important start of his career. I can't think of any that would have been more important. He went five innings, gave up two hits, struck out two, gave up zero runs against the Padres in a 2 to nothing Dodgers win. So elite stuff there from Yamamoto, guys. He looked very, very good out there. Uh, yeah, got to tip your cap. That was an amazing, amazing start from him. So he'll be wanting to back that up here. We'll see what he can do against the Mets. Obviously, a bit of a different situation. He faced them back in April and got shelled, but that was all the way back in April. 
not a lot of information we can glean from that. So we'll see what we get from uh, Yamamoto. I'm expecting decent stuff, but it's obviously still a little bit up in the air. In terms of their bullpen, the Dodgers were obviously excellent yesterday. Will they be able to follow that up with another excellent performance in this one? I'd say there's a chance. No reason there's not a chance. This has been a very good bullpen team over the course of the season. Absolutely no doubt about that. The Dodgers, certainly a bullpen that you can trust. The offense, you could obviously trust them. Last night, guys, eight runs on 10 hits. Very good stuff out there. Otani hitting a home run. That was his only hit of the night, but still good stuff. Uh, Mookie Betts got on the board. Freddie Freeman got on the board. Uh, Muncie got on the board. There a couple of hits for him, including a home run. He was walked three times. Monster, monster night there from Muncie. The dude looked like a monster out there. So, yeah, they, they went nuts against Severino, nuts against that Mets bullpen. Are they going to be able to back it up in this one? That is the question. Obviously, the Dodgers have been one of the best offensive teams in the majors all season long, so no reason to think they should suddenly hit some sort of brick wall. The guy that's hoping to provide that brick wall is Jose Quintana. He's going to be starting this game for the Mets, who need to bounce back, obviously, after getting shut out. We did not get anything we liked from Severino, really. I mean, he wasn't terrible. Four and two, there's innings, three hits, three strikeouts. But, yeah, not necessarily elite stuff. Didn't leave his team in the best spot. And, yeah, uh, yeah, Garrett got shelled. Megill got shelled. This is not a team that had a very good night out there. So, yeah, concerns abound now for the Mets as they head into this game of four. They're going to be hitting the ball, like I said, to Jose Quintana. He's 10 and 10 on the season, a 3.75 ERA. His last start was an excellent one against the Phillies. Over his last five starts, honestly, he's been very, very good. His last start was back on the ninth, so that's a slightly extended layoff, but nothing too crazy. I think he should be relatively okay out there. Obviously, going up against the Dodgers is a tough situation for any pitcher, and he hasn't faced them since back in May. Six innings, eight hits, three earned runs, a couple of home runs out there. Not the uh, not the ideal history you want against an opponent, but it was back in May, guys. That was a really long time ago. So we'll see if Quintana can bounce back a little bit in this one. In terms of their bullpen, obviously the Mets not coming off of the best night. They're going to need better work than that from the bullpen, but I don't think an improvement there would be too far out of the range of possibility, guys. This has been a team that got much, much better coming out of the pen over the last, uh, I would say, 40 games or 50 games of the regular season. Really turned it up a little bit, and it became a much, much better bullpen down the stretch. I'm expecting them to be much better in this game than they were in the last. Obviously, that doesn't take much, but I think we could see them, you know, if handed a lead, do some very, very positive things. And speaking of handing them a lead, guys, they're going to need a lot better stuff from their offense. We saw Lindor go hitless there in game three, guys. Not what you expect from him. Vientos got a hit. Nemo got a hit. Uh, Pete Alonso did not get a hit. Like, there are some big name guys in this lineup that sucked there in game three, and they're going to have to turn it up a little bit here in game four if they want to even this series. I'm, uh, I'm expecting better stuff here from the Mets offensively, no doubt about it. They've kind of felt like the team of destiny here in the playoffs, and generally speaking, they were not a bad offensive team over the course of the season, so definitely deserve to be where they're at right now. I think we see this defense look considerably better here in Game 4, so we'll see what we get, guys. Looking at the numbers for this one, we got the Dodgers at minus 142, the Mets at plus 120. We've got an over-under of 7 in this game. The Dodgers 45-35 and 35 on the road. The They're 43-36-1 and 36 and 1 to the over on the road. The Mets are 46 and 34 at home this season. So a very good home team. They are 42 and 38 to the over at home. So both teams showing trends towards the over guys. And in terms of that over under, I'm looking a little bit towards over seven. It's not a spot that I'm necessarily in love with, but I do think there's maybe just a smidgen of value out there on the over seven. But in terms of the side in this game, the Dodgers are big favorites at minus 142. The Mets obviously at plus 120, not massive underdogs, but man, that feels a little bit weird to me. We haven't necessarily seen uh, Yamamoto be dominant this season down the stretch. I mean, he got shelled by the Potteries in his first start against them, then did really well against them in his second start. He had some questionable starts at the end of the year against the Rockies. Like, this isn't somebody that has great history against the Mets, so I'm not 100% sold on him. I'm also not a million percent sold on Quintana, but if you ask me which guy I like better out there in a high-pressure postseason situation, I'm probably going to side slightly here with the veteran. So go ahead and give me the Mets here at plus 120 as a small lean. Not something that I really you know, like say is any sort of lock, but I do think it's a pretty good spot for them here playing at home in, you know, what has to be kind of a desperation mode spot now. So yeah, that's my lean on the over-under and on the side. Let's take a look at some props. First up, as always for you guys, I'm looking at the no run or yes run first inning. And in this game, siding towards the over and not super in love with either one of these starting pitching options, I'm leaning a bit towards yes run first inning, but all, like as always, guys, not a spot that I am super, super pumped about. In terms of some player props, there are some 
very good spots out there, guys. I like Max Muncy to get a hit in this game. The dude swinging the bat really, really well coming into this one. You could also take him one and a half, over one and a half total bases or something like that. He's a very reasonable home run option as well, but Regardless, guys, I just think this is a pretty good spot for him. And kind of on the same uh, you know, situation here, I like Mookie Betts to get a hit in this game. He only had one hit there in game three. This dude is a monster. I think we see him get at least one hit again in this game. He is not somebody that it's any problem to have there close to the top of the order. He's going to get plenty of at-bats, and he's going to be a monster. And right there in front of him, guys, Otani. Over one and a half total bases. I like this spot for Otani a lot. He still doesn't feel like, despite you know hitting a home run there yesterday, like he's hit his stride so far in the postseason. I think we see very, very good stuff from him in this one. People are not going to be able to pitch around at him in this game. And yeah, I think we see him get a hold of one. I You could take him as a, another home run prop. I wouldn't think that was crazy at all. But I think over one and a half total bases, I think that's a good enough spot for me. On the Mets side, guys, Lindor, definitely a huge bounce back for spot for him after going hitless. I love him to get a hit in this game. I also think uh, Vientos coming off of a one-hit performance continues to swing the bat well. I like him to get a hit in this game also. And if you're looking for a home run prop, guys, I think it's bounce back time for Pete Alonzo. He went 0 for 4 yesterday. I don't think that's what we see happen to him here. I like Pete Alonso to get a home run in this game a decent amount. So guys, that's all we've got for MLB. Now we're going to make one last transition. We are going to hop over and look at the two college football games on the slate. It's been really rough sledding here recently on the college football side of things over the last couple of days. But guys, with these super, super limited slates, it can be a little bit rough out there. But we've got a couple games here. I talked to our NCAA football expert about these two games. He has a premium lean on one of them, but he was able to give me some advice I think we can find some value on these games. So first up, guys, we are going to be taking a look at the Georgia State Panthers going on the road to take on the Marshall Thundering Herd. Obviously not two, you know, household names out here, but these are the games we've got in front of us, guys. Georgia State comes into this game fresh off of a loss over Old Dominion. They lost that one 21 to 14, so obviously not amazing stuff there. They uh, they tried to, you know, they made it relatively close. They did a good job moving the ball through the air. Uh, okay, I mean, 22 of 40 isn't great, though. One touchdown, one interception. The running game looked pedestrian as well there for Georgia State. The passing game, I mean, uh, Ted Hurst looked good out there. Six receptions, 85 yards, and a touchdown, but not really a team that I felt like, uh, you know, was killing it out there on offense. Obviously, only 14 points, not great in college football. They did turn the ball over twice in the game, so that is a pretty bad look. And yeah, on defense, they did slow down the pass, but they could not stop the run there against Old Dominion. They did generate one turnover so I guess that's something but generally speaking guys Georgia State not coming off of a very good performance and not really a team that I'm super high on they're not very good defensively not an amazing running team like not a very good offensive team whatsoever so definitely Georgia State not really a team that I'm expecting to have an amazing time there in the Sun Belt they have not gotten off to a good start and uh, there's reason to think uh, you know Maybe they can bounce back here. They've had that one insane win over Vanderbilt, winning 36 to 32. So you would think they would be a team, you know, with crazy, crazy potential, but they've been very up and down. I mean, in that win over Vanderbilt, we did see some very, very good stuff. We saw some bad stuff from Vanderbilt too, don't get me wrong, but the passing game for Georgia State looked amazing. The running game looked really good as well. They did a decent, but not amazing. I mean, they did have one turnover in that game. So we'll see what they can do here going up against the Marshall Thundering Herd, who come into this game three and three on the season fresh off of a very, very tough one-point loss there on the road against Georgia Southern, guys. They lost that game 24-23. to Rough stuff there for Marshall. They're, uh, you know, kind of in a bounce-back spot. Both teams are, though. Yeah, Marshall, the passing game, pretty much non-existent in that game. I mean, Braylon Braxton did okay. Uh, 9 of 12, 92 yards and two touchdowns. But uh, yeah, Stone Earl, Earl did not look good. The running game looked elite, though. I mean, 200 yards on 43 carries, very good stuff there. On defense, giving up 24 points, not the end of the world. They did force two turnovers, but Marshall gave up three turnovers of their own. That is really what sunk the ship for them in that game. So re weak, weak stuff there. Uh, yeah, they, they just have to be better than that, taking care of the ball. They've got to be a little bit better on defense, too. They struggled a lot against the passing game, so we'll see if they are able to, you know, handle that passing attack from Georgia State, which is a team that passed the ball well against a team as good as Vanderbilt once this season. So we'll see what they're able to do in this one. Looking at the numbers for this game, guys, Marshall is minus nine for this game at home. We've got an over under of 51 and a half. 
Georgia State is 1-4 and four against the spread this season. They are 3-2 and two to the under. Marshall is 5-1 and one against the spread this season and 4-2 and two to the under this season. Guys, I'm not going to lie. This might sound crazy, but I like Georgia State on the road getting the points in this one. They beat Vanderbilt this season. They should be able to keep things close against Marshall, a team that looks vulnerable to the passing game. My concern is how well will Georgia State be able to stop the running game, but getting 9 points is an awful lot of points. So I definitely think the Georgia State Panthers and the points, despite playing on the road, are the right side in this game game in terms of the over under here i'm leaning towards the under this game you know kind of prepared, kind of paired with the spread there leaning towards the underdog makes me think it's going to be a closer possibly more low scoring game and both teams here are showing trends towards the under so go ahead and give me under 51 and a half in this one as well last but not least here guys we are looking at the boston college eagles going on the road to take on the virginia tech Hokies. boston college comes into this game four and two on the season they've done some good things they got off to a great start there with that win at then number 10 fsu that one doesn't look quite as good now but still they uh, also won against Michigan State. They played a relatively close game there at Mizzou, but last week, guys, they lost at UVA 24-14. The week before that, they only managed a one-point win there over Western Kentucky. So, Boston College, not a team that there's a ton of reason to be super high on like there was early in the season, but we'll see what they can do here down the stretch last week against Virginia, guys. Uh, they passed the ball well, but got picked off twice. So, yeah, Thomas Castellanos, uh, two touchdowns, two interceptions, 254 yards, Got to take care of the ball out there. The Boston College running game got completely stuffed. That was a huge problem there. 29 carries for 65 yards. Not really going to get the job done. Not an amazing running day there for, I mean, Turbo Richard did look okay. Nine carries for 51 yards for him, but 20 of those yards came on one carry. You take that out, all of a sudden he was getting stuffed an awful lot. So we'll see how that looks. Uh, nobody really looked insane there in the receiving core. And yeah, they struggled on defense. They couldn't really stop the run effectively. Uh, Kobe Pace kind of tore them up. Uh, we saw the passing game really look good there for Virginia. The yeah, the Boston College defense wasn't able to force a turnover in that game. So yeah, definitely some uh, some concerns there. We'll see if they can bounce back here a little bit going up against Virginia Tech. So taking on another Virginia team right off the bat here. The Hokies come into this game uh, three and three on the season. They won last week at Stanford, thirty-one to seven. So a nice bounce back after a very very tough loss at number seven Miami. Guys losing thirty-eight to fourteen. A tough, tough loss there against a very good Miami team, but keeping themselves on track here with that win at Stanford has to feel very good for Virginia Tech. They, uh, yeah, they did some, a lot of positive things in that game. They scored in each quarter. They took care of the ball in the passing game, turning it over zero times, completing 14 of 19 passes for 201 yards. Kyron Drones, a very good game for him there under center. We also saw the running game look good. Uh, yeah, Tootin, uh, 21 carries, 73 yards, and a touchdown. Very little to complain about there. And across the board, guys, Virginia Tech did not turn over the ball in this game. That, as you know, is a huge, huge deal. And on defense, they generated two turnovers of their own, only allowed seven points. They completely stopped the run. They did uh, completely stop the pass. They did struggle, however, against the run. So that's what we're really going to be keeping an eye on here. Can Virginia Tech stop the running attack in this game? Unfortunately. Looking at the numbers for this one, guys, we've got Virginia Tech. They're minus 7.5 in this one. We've got an over-under of 48.5. Boston College, 3-2-1 against the spread this year, 5-1 to the under. Virginia Tech, 3-3 three and three against the spread, and 4-2 and two to the over. Guys, unfortunately, we do have a premium pick on this game against the spread over at stumpthespread.com, so I won't be able to give away the side on this one, but I can tell you the over is regarded as decent value in this game. Over 48.5 seems extremely reasonable. I think we'll see both teams score early and often in this game. 48 and a half, not that many points there in college football. I think we see them comfortably get over that total with, you know, both teams being able to move the ball through the air a little bit. Both teams can move the ball on the ground a little bit and neither defense is really terrifying to me. So give me the over in that one. That's all the games we have for today, guys. Hit that like button for good luck on all of your bets and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Let me know in the comments any questions you have on today's slate. Thanks for watching. You can click the link in the description to check out stumpthespread.com and we'll see you guys tomorrow for more sports betting action.